<laughs> the console is as old as me, actually. Uh, <laughs> Enjoy that. Just made me feel even older. That's <laughs> right. Uh, well, I guess you guys are all here to talk to me. It's a Q&A, right? So, you want to start with questions? Let's start, with, let's start with answers. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to try and read your minds and see if I can figure out what you guys want to ask. Telepathic and communication. Go with something along the lines of tuxedo mask. Hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> Just I'm going out on a limb on this one. I don't know. Uh, anybody got any questions? Anything you guys want to say? Anything? Everybody's all shy. Yeah, go for it. Yes. I'm talking a lot. Um, Introduce yourself to everybody. Um, my, my name is Chris. Hey, hey Chris. I'm in hat. Right on. Man in the hat, I like it. <laughs> um, so, I actually did not know who you were until last night at the Cards Against Humanity panel, but... <laughs> can, you, can you tell me who I am? Because sometimes That's, I forget. It's well, day to day. It it's, <laughs> comes and goes. Well, all I know is that you were the original Tuxedo Mask. Yeah. You said you've been doing this for 20 years, which makes sense, because that anime was from oh, when no. I was a kid. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what other stuff have you done since, before... Um, um, just a little more voice of Zexion in Kingdom Hearts. I met Mac earlier, who's Kingdom Hearts fan, right? Uh, and, uh, I've done a ton of a uh, bunch of video games, and uh, I mean a lot of old school stuff that I was on uh, when I was back in Toronto, like Ace Ventura: Pet Detective. I was Shitty Dance in that original <laughs> series. I was the landlord. Uh, Brace Face. I was all in in that. Um, yeah, it was a fun show. I had a good time on that show. Um, uh, Carlos Oliveira in uh, Resident Evil 3. Um, gosh, I forget. I mean, I've done a ton of stuff. Tons of video games. Punisher video game, Watchmen video game, Spider-Man, EverQuest. Uh, it's so funny. We, had, we did a VO, a voice actor panel this morning and just hearing guy, everybody talk about ripping their cords apart and stuff to make different video games. And, that takes me back. <laughs> and still does. That's the fun of video games. Great. Yeah, you never want to have another session the next day, you know, right after a video game, especially if you're doing any of the violent ones. Uh, so yeah, that's some of my stuff. I imagine some of you guys are here for those reasons. Anybody a fan of the Resident Evil stuff? Right on. Excellent. Kingdom Hearts. Excellent. I, I, I've heard rumors that there's another episode coming out, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, any other questions? Anything anybody wants to ask? How did yeah. you get your How did you get your start in the business? Uh, I started out. Um, uh, I went to Ryerson Theater School and University Ryerson University, and I went to the theater acting department, and I got my degree in acting. And uh, in second year, there was a microphone technique class, and I remember thinking, microphone technique, like you hold a microphone. Terrible. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we don't want that thing going on. Uh, so in second year, I remember walking into this microphone technique class thinking, Mike, look, don't you just hold a mic? And, and, uh, but it was all about voice acting. And uh, our teacher was a guy named Roland Parliament, who was, uh, part of, he was part of the Salem Moon world. He was our, one, our director on it uh, for many years. And um, he got sort of introduced me to that whole world and little did I know I was as a little kid I would always, you know, Scooby Doo was my favorite show when I was a kid <laughs> growing up. And I would just always imitate all the, you know, characters and never ever dreamed that you'd actually, you know, have a career getting to do that. You know, I never even thought about it. You know, you just loved those characters and didn't even realize that there was voices behind those, you know, especially my age when I was a little kid. I mean we didn't you know, you guys now get your own rig at home and do voiceover and, you know, and create your own stuff back then. That didn't even, that was the furthest thing from my imagination. Uh, and so in second year, I started taking that class. And then one of my, I remember Roland bringing in a guest teacher, Susan Roman, who was actually, she actually was a guest teacher. And then we ended up working together on Sailor Moon, which was kind of, kind of fun. And, and that's where it all began. I just took to it, you know, uh, like a horse to water. And it just was awesome. I loved it. And, you know, I mean, it's just, there's something pretty amazing. We were talking about it earlier today, too. There's something incredibly amazing about voice acting, and, you know, as, a, as an on-camera actor as well, and theater actor as well. Um, you're always restricted by your physical presence, you know, you're, and 
restricted isn't the right word, but you're always, you know, I, I am who I am and I can't really change it. You can costumes, you can do prosthetics and things like that, but to a certain extent, you know, I'm the height that I am, I'm the physicality that I am. In VO, you can be anything. You know, you're only limited by your imagination, which is phenomenal and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just an incredible world. You know, I think it's one of the, uh, one of the greatest aspects of being an actor is the voiceover side of it. It's, you know, I mean, if you can dream it, you can be it. So we should write a song about that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got my start. Thing. That was the microphone technique class in Ryerson University. Yeah. And Roland actually gave me my first VO job. Yeah. Well, in animation. <laughs> Anything else? Step up, guys. Come on. All right. All right. Hang on. Matt had his hand up, but then I'll get to you. I promise. So is it different working out for Disney than other like places? Disney's the happiest place in the world. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it different working for Disney? I, you know what? I think it's different working for every different company. Every company has like sort of a way that they work, or you know. Um, uh, I've worked for Disney in voiceover. I've worked for Disney in, on camera. Um, you know, I was. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys know the Disney movie, Disney Channel movies. I was Jackal Johnson in the Cheetah Girls, in the first film. You were Jet Jackson too, right? I was Jet Jackson. I was in Jet Jackson. And I was Plunkett. And I was his agent. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, that was a great show. Uh, what was that? And Quince. Yes. Wow. Jeez. Now, can you remind me? If anybody wants questions about what I've done, please speak to her. She seems to know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it just depends from um, place to place. You know, every director has their own style. Every, you know, production company has their own style. But you know, there's certain um, there's certain you know ways and techniques that carry over and cross over for anything that you do. But uh, you know, Disney's. Uh, Disney's interesting. I have to say, some of my favorite jobs were the, the Disney Channel films. Uh, I, and it, interestingly enough, I mean, I've, I've heard other people say it differently, but I think the roles I got to play in a lot of those Disney Channel movies were, um, you know, uh, they were just very, I had a lot of freedom to create. I got a lot of freedom to improv, and, uh, you know, sometimes you get on sets, especially with episodic television, um, you know, you don't get a lot of time, you kind of come in, it's like you got to do your job and know your lines, and sometimes, depends on the screen, the writers, you know, they're very strict about their words, and on the Disney films, man, they just, uh, you know, they just let me do my thing, they were just like, whatever you want to do, and, which was a lot of fun, and, and also it was really fun too, uh, I think for me, on all those movies, to work with, you know, uh, you know like Raven Simone, and all these kids when they were so young, and then to see them grow and become, who they were, and I could tell instantly every time I've worked with somebody that you know was a kid, and you just see the poise and the, the talent that was there. I was, uh, I knew instantly like who was going to be a star, who was going to break out, and, you know. So, any uh, any other questions you had? Oh, I just want to say it's so nostalgic hearing your voice again. <laughs> um, what was that? It's so nostalgic hearing your voice from like middle school watching Sailor Moon. So I just wondered what you thought of like Sailor Moon getting a reboot. You thought that was like. I think it's amazing. I mean, you know, it's like, come on, it's one of the, it's one of the original animes to break. To it, so. Of course, I mean, I'm, I'm heartbroken that they didn't want to bring us back and make us a yeah. part of it. You know what I mean? It's such a major, major uh, part of my life. I mean, it was my first ever anime job. Yeah. My first ever, uh, you know, I'd done tons of dubbing, but it was always like ADR, dubbing my own voice and stuff in film and television prior to that. But Sailor Moon was the first time I had done any like, you know, VO dubbing and in that respect. Uh, at the same time, there were some other projects I was working on, but you know, Sailor Moon was like the one that, you know, I was, we worked on that for years. You know. uh, so yeah, it, well, it's near and dear to my heart. And Tuxedo Mask, I mean, it's a great character. It's yeah. one of the ultimate greatest <laughs> characters. And it was such an honor. And you know, I think all of us, every single one of us, that was part of that original series. And, you know, we're all still friends. And I mean, even though I moved away, and uh, a lot of them back in Toronto, we still stay in touch. And, uh, Linda Valentine and I went to Ryerson University together. So we actually, yeah, we were in, uh, you know, acting school together before we even had, became professional actors. So that was kind of cool to have that uh, sort of grow, you know, um, and have that history together. Uh, so I, and all of us.
great friends, and I think we would have loved the chance to kind of get to hang out again and do it all over. Um, but at the same time, I get it. I get, and it's also a different direction that they've gone. You know, they've gone back to sort of the real, the Japanese version. You know, ours was sort of the after-school version. <laughs> <laughs> The censored version. Yes, the very censored version. I'll never forget, uh, we were probably like half a season in, um, and uh, Nicole, who was our producer on it, she showed up one day with an original episode, you know, and, and, and then decided to show it to us, and I swear to God, every one of us, our jaws were just like, <laughs> we just could not believe that that was the same show that we were dubbing, because they had changed it so much to make it so you know, cute and after school and accessible for, you know, kids and stuff. And the Japanese version aired late at night, like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. And, you know, it was much more adult. And, uh, uh, but I think that's what made Sailor Moon so special, too, is that even though, you know, Deke and they, they, they geared it towards an after school and kids, it still had themes that were much more adult. They weren't, you know, I mean, as much as I love Scooby-Doo, you know, we always, the, those, <laughs> those kinds of stories were pretty predictable. I mean, it was always the same kind of thing, whereas Sailor Moon started to deal with all these different, like, real kid problems and real, you know, like, like love at that age or, you know, growing up, being awkward, discovering yourself, like, just those intricacies of, you know, relationships that we were going through when we were that age. And I think that's why so many people related to it and, uh, you know, identified with all the different Sailor Scouts and, you know, and I think that's why it became so iconic. So I'm glad to see it come back, and I, I'm heartbroken that I wasn't, <laughs> that we weren't part of it. Thank you for saying that. Although, I, you know, I, it's funny meeting all uh, the new cast. They're all awesome people, you know, and I, uh, I haven't had a chance to see any of the episodes, but I've heard nothing but amazing stuff about it, so I think it's awesome. I think it's great. Maybe there'll be a crossover. Ooh. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, welcome. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned that you're um, based in LA now, and since the uh, New I'm York actually in New York now. Oh, okay. I've been in New York for the last two years. I was in LA for 12 years, but I just moved to New York a couple years ago. Okay, that kind of messes up my question by like, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, but, um, my, my, well, it's, well, I'll just ask anyway. Sure. Um, I still have my house in LA, so I still go back, but I okay. just, I've been in New York for the last but, um, couple years. Um, if, if you're given the chance to like audition for a new dub of Sailor Moon, not because well for like future roles like like maybe a future filler or something that's yeah. coming up, would you do it? Absolutely not. How dare they not? Of course. <laughs> of course, that would be awesome. That'd be amazing. Um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Jeremy said something in in our earlier panel that I thought was really uh, powerful, and I've always believed it. I've said it. Anybody that asks me about you know becoming an actor or getting into VO or whatever. You know, to me, work begets work, and I always, you know, I'm not above anything. The minute you start to think you are above stuff, the minute you start to die a death creatively. <laughs> um, there comes a time where, you know, there are points in your career where sometimes you go, I'm not going to take this job because, you know, maybe it's just not the best direction for me right now, or it doesn't speak to me, you know, but I've, I, I can't honestly say that that's happened. I can't even count that on one hand, the times that that's happened. Um, just because I believe too, uh, you know, I don't, um, I don't like to judge the work that I'm doing. Typically, I mean, I think you know, as long as there's a, a creative intention behind it, uh, you know, I always think that that's an ability to stretch myself as an actor and explore new things. And you never know what you're, you're going to discover. You know, I remember uh, being in Toronto, um, and a friend of mine, we were at a commercial audition, and uh, he, he just, he was just like, that's it. I'm not auditioning for commercials ever again. Bad at auditioning. He was like, I'm not doing this ever again. They're a waste of time. They're, you know, they're 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 soul sucking. There's no art to it. And I remember thinking, man, acting in a commercial, there's so much art to it, and the technique is even harder because you're trying to tell a full story, realize a re a whole life in sometimes 15 seconds or 30 seconds or 60 seconds, which is much harder to connect and make a real honest choice and make it, you know, impactful and and. You know, you're trying to find a nugget of comedy in, in, in just two seconds, or you're trying to have a real, honest, like, heartfelt moment in 30 seconds. You know, whereas in a movie, you have much more time to build that, say, with a TV series. Um, so, 
you know, I would absolutely jump at a chance to be part of it. I think that would be so cool. I think it would be great for the fans too. I think fans would love that, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and as I was saying earlier, to me, any chance to work with people, creative people, you know, you never know where that's going to lead and where that's going to take you. So, you know, you know, to me, always keep your doors open. Yeah. Anything else? Sure. Go ahead. Um, what was it like going from Allen to Tuxedo Mask? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah, I was, I don't know if some of you guys know, but I was Allen in the Doom Tree. Uh, part first, and then Reno Romano was uh, Tuxedo Mask, a friend of mine, and then Reno moved away, Toby took it over for a little while, and then they decided to make a change, and, uh, and then I took it over for the bulk of the, the remainder of the episodes. Um, it was kind of odd, it was kind of odd at first, I remember when they asked me to do it, I was like, really, I mean, aren't people going to be weirded out by the fact that I was Alan, and you know, I was sort of, you know, but I, of course I jumped at the chance again, I've never been a person to ever say, no, I don't think this makes sense, I was like, I'm honored, sure, I'll do it, and I'd already been part of the world and got to know, and I, Roland was my teacher, at the time he was directing episodes, and so it was a really easy transition, I knew all the actors, you know, we've been working together uh, in the Doom Tree uh, series, um, so uh, it was it was awesome, I was a little bit kind of, at first it was, I was a little nervous for the first few episodes too because you know they had Reno, then they had Toby, and then they brought me in. I was sort of like, how am I going to establish myself? What am I going to do vocally, or you know, what do I, what am I going to bring to the table? But um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, as an actor, I always just try to make the best choices that make the most sense, and, and just sort of went, you know, I, I feel like they picked me for a reason, and so I just kind of went with my own instincts, and you know, I, I think it worked. I think people seem to like it. <laughs> So you had something in the back? Oh, I was just wondering, uh, yeah. did you, did you ever watch the things that you voice acted in? Yeah, yeah. Um, many <coughs> times. Um, not the whole, I've never watched the whole Sailor Moon series. <laughs> oh. But I've caught bits and pieces of that. Honestly, dubbing is interesting too because when you dub, you know, um, we don't really, we're, we're not originally creating the character. So I'll hear the Japanese and then we go straight in and we're reading off what we did. Sailor Moon was done uh, using a system called Rhythm of Band, where the words are written out and they're, you know, elongated if you're screaming or they're short and you speak when the word hits the line. <clears throat> so, there were many times where I would do entire scenes and I'd have no clue. No clue what I just said. No clue what the scene was about. Because it's sort of phonetic. You know, it's almost like, um, I don't want to liken it to this, but it's almost like reading Braille where you kind of, you almost feel it, where you feel the rhythm. That's why they call it Rhythm of Band. You feel the rhythm of the words. And we would, and before, I would just hear the Japanese version to kind of get a sense of the, you know, the vocal, like the, the level, like if it was a battle scene, if I was yelling from a distance, or if we were intimate, you know. Um, and then after that, we'd just go in, and I didn't speak Japanese, so I had no clue what was being said. Uh, and we often didn't get scripts, you know. I mean, some days I'd walk in, we'd record like 10 episodes in a day. So, you know, you'd, you'd get there a little bit beforehand, and you start to read through, but then you know you don't have enough time to read every script. So, uh, crazily enough, there were there were you know entire episodes where I'd record the whole episode and not have a clue what happened in the episode. <coughs> but in the moment, you know I would know exactly what was going on in that scene in the moment. You know, and you'd read through it, and then oftentimes we'd do one pass through, go back, and then you'd really start to dig your heels in and, and kind of find those nuances, you know, the emotional depth of it or, you know, whatever was going on or try to find, you know, but, and we were, again, we were moving so fast, sometimes 10 episodes in a day, so, you know, not a lot of times, but once in a blue moon, I'd be like, no, no, I need to do one more because I know I, I got to bring this to it, you know, but you're also, it's amazing with dubbing too, you're uh, very restricted by, you know, what you can and can't do at times um, because of needing to hold a word, you know, if you're screaming, you need to hold that for the length until the word stops on the end. So you have to find something that makes sense very quickly, make it make sense, um, uh, you know, but it has to fit into that pocket. So, you know, because of the old school way of matching the lip flaps, matching the, the way the, the mouths were speaking. And, and sometimes, I mean, it's probably why Tuxedo Masks has some amazingly bizarre stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, I would show up 
to, I would show up to a battle, mid-battle, and suddenly I'd have this like long-winded speech. <laughs> and the stuff that would come out, I'd just be like, is that even, is that even, does the grammar of that even make sense? I don't understand it. And I could tell that they were just writing words in because they needed me to move my mouth one more time or that, you know, I had to match the consonant or the vowel or, you know, because, and we'd have these problems where suddenly we'd do a pass and then watch it back quickly and you'd be like, oh, that's odd because I'm holding the word here. I'm saying like, uh, love, and, you know, and, but he's like, his mouth is going, you know, like three flaps, and you go, that's not, that's not gonna look right. So suddenly everybody would be scrambling, like, well, what, what, what can we say? Um, true love, you know, and then you'd be like, just, so, yeah, I'd have these outrageous sayings, you know, and then I'd throw rows, you know, <laughs> which would make, would crack me up. And I, I remember when we first started, too, I'd be thinking, is anybody gonna buy into this? Like, this is just outrageous. <laughs> It's ridiculous, you know, and then the, and then, you know, I, I remember within about, not even within, in a year, suddenly thousands, and this is, you know, we're going back like, what, 15, 16, 17 years ago now, 18 years ago, you know, internet isn't the way it is now, I mean, websites, like, the, it was unbelievable the, how it blew up, you know, uh, so it was pretty overwhelming, uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, c compared to how they do voiceover dubbing uh, uh, today, as opposed to like let's say back in 1995 when you, or or, or in the uh, not just 1995, but there's so many different styles of dubbing now. They're, even even today, now, there's many different ways of doing it. People some some people still use the rig of They still do. Yeah. Um, now, um, 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 does using the rhythm band seem a harder way to go about voiceover dubbing than, let's say, um, other uh, uh, other modern ways of dubbing that they use today? Um, if I'm being honest, uh, I the rhythm band is so precise. I mean, for me, you know, I, I loved it. It's it's a it's a tricky thing to learn though. I mean, if uh, I found anybody that had a musical background, which is why I think they call it rhythm band, because it, it's very rhythmical. Um, hmm. You know, you if you sight read music, or if you have, you know, if you have a dance background or something like that, you have some sort of you know musical aspect that you know that that you relate to. Um, I think the rhythm band is easy, but some people it takes a while and, and they struggle with it uh, just to to be able to. It's very multi-brain thing where you're watching words hit a, hit a line. You're, you, you get in this system where you start to read ahead too, even though you're watching the word hit the line. So it's, it's kind of a bizarre thing, but it's very, it's very musical. Um, but once you get it, I found it so precise. I mean, I thought, you know, I've done a ton of different ways of dubbing, you know, the, the beeps, the, the three beep, the, you know, the, the multi beeps. Um, I just, <laughs> For me, rhythm band just takes all the guesswork out. One of the things it does, though, is it also, as I said earlier, it does, it's so precise that it also then cages you in a little bit in terms of when you see the way things are written out on the band, some people find it difficult to make choices outside of the, out of, you know, to, to quickly make an emotional connection to the way that word is being expressed. Whereas when you, if you do dubbing using beeps or, you know, or the, or the slices, um, it's, there's more freedom in it. Once you get your cue to start, you, there's more freedom to go, but then it's not as precise to matching the, the lip flaps uh, on, the, uh, on the characters. So, uh, some of you are staring at me like, what is that guy talking about right now, man? I have no idea. Too technical. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> there is, there's the difference. One is, to me, the rhythm band was incredibly precise. I've never seen anything else. Uh, I've never used any other system that was as precise. Um, but for some people, it's really hard. It's, it's very difficult. You can see the people that would struggle. And I loved it. I loved it because I'm very musical. And, you know, to me, it was like sights, you know, singing. Hmm. Somebody in the back there keeps poking their hand forward and then <laughs> you're, you're um, deking in and out. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you had a favorite variant catchphrase or something. <laughs> wow, who doesn't love? Hey, 
Hey, me ball head. <laughs> hey, me ball head. Everybody loves that phrase. I mean, so many. Tuxedo mask, I don't even know. I mean, honestly, the stuff that came out of my mouth was tuxedo mask was just outrageous. I remember one, I remember finding one once a few years ago, and I was just like, I said that. It's, it's insane. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Does anybody have a favorite catchphrase of theirs? Yeah, come on, that's the classic, right? The greatest. Anybody know any tuxedo mask outrageous sayings? Uh, I used to do a Salem Moon panel, one of my favorite clips is from the Salem Moon Mask movie, where Tuxedo Mask literally says, Sailor Moon, don't eat the donut, it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a super S movie. I love it, I love it. That shows the stuff we did in that show. <laughs> I mean, he's technically correct. Donuts can be dangerous, <laughs> but they are so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't real donuts. Exactly. It was an illusion. <laughs> Somebody's in the back there with their hand up. You're hiding. Come on forward. Um, I was just wondering, is there a series that's like, that's like, um, you could say popular or maybe prominent in this moment in time that you always wanted to do voiceover work in or act? I mean, you know, I was very lucky when I first moved to LA. I got to do an episode of Scooby Doo, you know, the new Scooby Doo series. Um, so that was awesome. That was one of my dreams, and I was able to check that off my list. And I got to work with, you know, Casey Kasem. I stood right Aww, beside him. Okay, oh, wow. <clears throat> yeah. So weeks. Hey, Scoob. It was awesome. It was awesome. It was the greatest, one of the greatest moments. Um, uh, and Fred Walker. Uh, you know, and he was the original um, Freddy, and uh, but at the time he also was doing Scooby because Don Messick was no longer doing it. Um, and in our episode, he was also the Invisible Madman. So he had this incredible scene where he fought himself as Freddy, and Scooby jumps in to save Freddy. You know, he's a genius. He's a genius. Um, so that was something that you know, was definitely huh. one of my checklists. Um, and today, I mean, there's so many, there's so many great shows, but uh, I think mostly I would want to do stuff that was sort of my childhood, you know, like, like shows that I loved, like uh, like the Transformers. Yeah. I was a big Transformers fan as a kid. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing that. You know, it, it's more old school stuff. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm an 80s kid. <laughs> Anything you guys want me to be in? Write to the producers and tell them. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, somebody had a hand up in the back? Um, you mentioned there were different types of dubbing. Uh, I was wondering, is there any significant difference between animation and video games? Um, well, uh, one, the dubbing process, I don't, I don't think I've ever dubbed for a video game. Um, oh, actually, what am I talking about? Kingdom Hearts, of course. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I've done a million dubbing for video games. Uh, White Knight Chronicles, too. You know. um, uh, that's true, but it's different. Again, even with the video games, we don't do any of that precision stuff. It's kind of, well, sometimes in the cutscenes, there's a little bit more precise dubbing, but, um, no, I find, I mean, uh, I don't, you know, when it comes to the dubbing, there, there's so much similarity, you know, you're always trying to match those lip flaps, you're trying to get to the heart, and like, still bring an emotional core to the character, you're trying to make choices, even though you're restricted by what's already been created. Um, I think the biggest difference between animation, video games, and any, uh, and any Western animation is when you get from already produced dubbing into original. You know, that's the... When you're creating a character like you know Alden and Brace Face, or you know and the, any of those other stuff that I've done, uh, you know it's my it's my I get to make those choices. I, I'm not restricted by what's already been created, which is personally as as an artist, that's always the most fulfilling stuff. 
you know. Um, although sometimes there's also an incredible freedom, like the tuxedo mask, and you know, there's an incredible freedom to see something already laid down, and then you go, huh, that, like you get to see sort of a bed track almost, and you go, I would do it this way. It's, it's almost like getting to see a dry run, and then going, I know how to make it better. You know, not that I'm, would, not that I mean that from, you know, that trying to be better than what's already been produced, but you see something so it gives you an insight into what's happening, and you hear it, and you go, oh, I know how I can bring my thing to that. So there's something fun about that too. Um, but definitely original, original series, original stuff is, there's, you know, there's just, it's your imagination. You get a lot more, you know, it's a lot more creative. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the question was asked earlier, if it came up or something, but um, what, uh, Acting? Yeah. Um, well, I wanted. I was. Uh, it was kind of asked earlier, but um, uh, I I wanted to be an actor. You know, film and TV, and I started out doing theater in, in high school, and uh, and then in university there was a class in second year called microphone technique, and that's where we did. It was all geared towards voiceover acting, and that's where it sort of all took off from there. I had no I. You know, I answered this earlier, but uh, I had no idea. I mean, I never intended to become a voice actor. And then all of a sudden, you know, I took the class and just, you know, fell in love with it. Just to do it naturally. And I booked my first voiceover audition that I went to. And kind of just went from there. Yeah. Just went from there. But I'm really glad I did. Because I, honestly, I get, you know, you know, silly questions sometimes you get asked about. You know, would you ever choose one or the other? And I couldn't imagine. It's not possible, you know, to choose one. I love Bo. I love, I love acting, you know, on, on the stage. I love acting for on camera, um, and I love voice acting. I mean, as I as I said earlier too, uh, there's an incredible freedom in voice acting that you will never find anywhere else. It's, you know, a level of creativity that you know you can be, you can be a, you know, you can be a, an alien. You can be a 4,000 foot tall man, you know, you can be a blob, you know, <laughs> all kinds of stuff, and, you know, in, in, uh, in live action that doesn't typically happen unless they're using special effects, and, you know, and nowadays there's more and more of that, which is awesome too, but, uh, but even that nowadays, even when you get into live action, you start to do that, a lot of that is done in post, so it almost is voice acting as well, you know, where you're creating the character in post. Anybody else? Sure. Yeah, you said you were into like um, a lot of musical things. So what kind of music do you like? Uh, what kind of music do I like? Yeah. Uh, my favorite band of all time is U2. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, I'm, my my tastes are pretty, you know, they cross the board. I think anything that's anything that's well written, I love. You know, I love a lot of current stuff too. Um, but. Uh, I sang in a band, a cover band for years in Toronto as well, and uh, a, cover we did a cover band, yeah, we had some originals, classic rock band, we did like Beatles, and <laughs> you know, we did, uh, we did the Stones, uh, we were Canadian, I'm originally from Toronto, I don't know if a lot of you guys know that, so we did a lot of Canadian bands, you know, like Bare Naked Ladies, um, stuff like that, uh, <laughs> you know, John Cooper Mellencamp. Uh, but I'm also a big fan of like, you know, I, I, I don't know if you guys know, but I've done a lot of musical theater as well. And I was in Rocky on Broadway recently, um, this past year. And uh, I was in Mamma Mia, the national tour of Mamma Mia, I played Harry Bright. And uh, I mean, I grew up listening to ABBA too, you know, my parents and country music, Johnny Cash, uh, but old school country. It's weird, I like some new country. I don't want to offend anybody. I like some new country, but old school country, is, yeah, uh, is more. I think it's because of why I grew up with it. Um, but I'm also a big fan of like Michael Bublé and, and you know, classic uh, stuff like that. Um, yeah, you know, and who doesn't love a good musical theater torch song, right? <laughs> a little let it go. Uh, I feel like that's all I hear nowadays. That's <laughs> how. Uh, yeah, Mac. Um, who do you think would win in a fight between all the characters that exist? 
winning a fight between all my characters. <laughs> wow. Jeez, that's a tough one. Huh. I don't know. I mean, Caesar from White Knight Chronicles. You know, he's, he's got some pretty cool powers. Um, yeah, Zexion. Yeah. I don't know. That's a tough one. Let's try to make that happen. We should do a mashup video game like that, right? <laughs> and then see if I can get all those all those companies together and create a video game where all my characters fight each other. I did have one cool that that actually makes me remember a, a little side note in an episode of Sailor Moon. I don't remember which one it is. Uh, I was never credited for it, but I remember begging Nicole. I was like, once I took over Tuxedo Mask, we were into the. It was like I think it was the final season that we we dubbed. And I remember we knew that it was sort of coming to an end and we weren't sure that we were going to do any more. Um, hmm. And uh, I was like, I want to be a villain. I want to fight myself <laughs> in an episode. And so uh, Nicole gave me one of the characters. I can't remember the episode it was. Um, but I ended up voicing the villain and I got to you know, kick my own ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of cool. Um, what do you guys think would win? <laughs> all in. He would he would sweep them to death, man. And then all the other guys would come at him with like the forces, and he'd just be like singing a sweet song, and like, you know. <laughs> They'd be like, "Aw, shucks, that guy's so cute." <laughs> yeah. There is absolutely nothing in the world like it. There truly is nothing like it. I mean, there is a there is a beautiful art to all aspects of what we do as actors. Um, as I've talked about many times, the freedom, the creativity, the imagination that you bring to the table as a voice actor. Um, you know, the challenges of. Uh, I mean, uh, my one of my personal favorite things is you know feature film. Fe uh, Feature film and, and dramatic feature film is something that really speaks to me just because I like sinking my teeth into something, like the work of it. I love that whole. But the stage is, I mean, it's just, you know, the fear, the excitement, you know, the smell of the grease pink, the roar of the crowd. You know, it's, it's amazing. And Rocky was pretty special. I mean, that was a pretty amazing show. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys heard anything about the show, but, you know, we. I know. It was uh, it was it was very tragic. We're all it's so funny, we all are so close. We actually just celebrated our one year anniversary of our first preview on, on the thirteenth. And so just like yesterday, there was this giant uh, we still all email each other at, at Christmas and like and it's just this massive email trail of like everybody that worked on the show. It was a real bonding experience. It was a, an incredible show and uh, so it's so funny right now, like today, I've got about 50 emails, it's, you know, all of us, there's about 80, 90 of us that stay in touch with all the, the creative team, the, the technical people, and uh, we're actually get, I'm gonna have a reunion uh, in March, like all of us gonna get together. I mean, some of us still see each other all the time around New York, um, but like everybody's gonna try and make it and get together again. And it was a pretty special show. Uh, yeah, we had, we had a giant, you know, boxing ring that actually Flew and it was it was amazing. The the choreography Stephen Hoggett. I don't know if, if any of you guys are familiar with theater. Stephen Hoggett choreographed once. Um, he choreographed I mean, Peter and the Starcatcher. He's a genius. Um, uh, I, if, you guys, if you guys ever get to New York, go see Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. It's just a beautiful show. It's just, it's genius. Um, it deals with autism. It's just so powerful. And Stephen did the choreography for that. Um, he did last ship, and our choreography was amazing. It was just, you know, I mean, stuff that very different because you know it wasn't traditional dance. We were boxing, you know. I mean, our our final the final fight scene in Rocky is almost twenty minutes long, and it's all choreographed. So the intricacy of that final scene, once we step on once we stepped on stage to start that final scene, there was no stopping. You know, you've got I mean, all the makeup was done in the ring in front of the audience, all hidden. He would, all of a sudden, you know, one minute Rocky would be like, you know, fresh face, and the next thing you know, he's got blood coming out of his eye, he's got, you know, 
skin, like just, it was it was incredible. It was just amazing, and every person was part of that, the whole cast. And so it was, yeah, it was pretty exciting, uh, but also very dangerous. I mean, the boxing stuff was was amazing, and you know, our our, our set was so intricate. Um, it was pretty exciting. Um, but there, you know, again, going back to the original question, there's nothing like doing stage. I mean, when you connect with an audience, uh, you know, it's it's immediate. It's it's you know, you're. I mean, the, tr the truth is, what we do as actors is, you know, uh, we create something to share it with uh, with other people. You know, what I mean, we, if you do it for yourself, I had a teacher. It's a little crass, but I had a teacher early on in my career just saying. You know, if you make art just for yourself, to please yourself, that's called masturbation. <laughs> so, and uh, I remember thinking, yeah, I mean, it's a crass way of saying it, but he's kind of right. You know? When you do something to make yourself happy, you're, you know, you're just getting yourself off. The whole point is for us to, keep, to, to connect, you know, and that's why, that's why the art of acting, that's why theater, film, TV, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the oldest professions and, and is still there today. And, it's, and, and, I, and I think it's one of the reasons why we also you know, revere actors, we hold them up, we, we, you know, we kind of place a significance to them because they are, we are the, you know, as actors, we are the mirror of our lives. You know, we, we kind of touch on the truths of who we are. We, sometimes in a tough way, we make our, so we hold up the mirror and it's not pretty to look at, but we have to do it. And, you know, and it helps to influence us for the choices we make in the future. It helps us sometimes to realize things about ourselves that we don't know, because you see yourself in a character. Um, and uh, you know, and with theater, there just is there's nothing more there's nothing more immediate than that. Like you, you do your work, and then you take it to the audience, and it's right there. And you immediately find out if it makes sense. You connect. You get that feedback. And there's also an element to that too that influences your work when you do when you do stage, where in that moment sometimes the way an audience reacts changes your story that night. You know, you 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 still tell the same story, but you tell it in a slightly different way because the audience reacts a different way. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget, Rocky was a dram you know, very dramatic. You know, everybody knows the movie. But we had a couple, couple performances uh, out of, uh, where I think it was only twice, where honestly I thought it was a comedy. It was so weird, like the audience just, two nights where the audience just found everything hilarious. <laughs> And I mean, uproariously laughing, like it was, you know, like you were watching a, a Family Guy episode. And like on stage, the cast, we were, we, like, we're trying not to laugh, we're trying to do these serious scenes, but we're just suddenly going, what, what is happening? This is not the show we're telling, no one's doing anything different. But the audience that night just, for some reason, found everything funny, and I thought, it, and sometimes that happens too, where, you know, you'll get a group of audience members that'll just react differently, and then that, you can feel it spread through the entire audience. The whole audience gets on board with that. And then it turns into a comedy. And you know, I mean, there was a scene between Polly and Rocky in the Meat Factory that, like, that you couldn't even hear what they were saying. The audience was just laughing so much, and we were just going, that scene was dead serious on other nights. Like, dead serious. Where you're, it's so, like, you know, it's so sad and pathetic, you know? And then on that night, twice it happened, where it was just, it turned into this uproarious comedy. And that's, that's beautiful, it's magical. As an actor, that's magical, where you just go, man, I never saw that coming. And then you suddenly roll with it, you can't fight it. You know, and there's, so there's an incredible beauty and incredible, um, you know, as I said, the, to me, the word magic is the best way to describe it. There's just no other way of you know, doing stages. Any of you guys, stage actors, any of you guys done theater? Yeah. Right on. Opera and uh, what? Wow, right on. All right, any of you guys want to be actors or voice actors? Or? A show of hands. Come on, there's more of you here than one. You guys, all right, right on. Awesome. Any of you guys have done stuff so far? Anybody? Excellent. Right on. Like video games and animation and stuff. Uh, mostly self-produced stuff. All right. Yeah, Good. That's awesome. That's how you got you got to do it. Exactly. We were talking about that in, on the, in the panel this morning. Yeah, we were talking about that this morning. You know, there's, I mean. The avenues to creating stuff nowadays, God, I wish they were around when I was a kid. You know, just uh, and now you can you know you can make your own stuff and, and get it out there and get immediate feedback and go, hey, this is this is a good idea. I can roll with this, or you know, sometimes you'll go, this sucks, and you're like, all right, you know. But failure, there's no such thing as failure. Never let anybody tell you that there's failure as an actor. There's only learning and growing. There's no such thing as a wrong choice in my as far as 
as far as I'm concerned. There's choices that seem more right, but there's, you know, there's no such thing as a wrong choice. You know, you just got to get out there and do it. You know. Uh, anything else? Anyone else? Sure. Yeah. Do you, I was just wondering if you had any, like, keepsakes from Salem, from anything that you've done, really. Um, I have, I have some posters that we all signed, you know, the whole cast when we, just before we finished the show, and I have uh, that one, a particular one, framed in my office in the recording studio in Los Angeles. Um, but, I mean, that's the only sad thing about doing VO, is that there isn't really, there's no props, there's no costumes, you know. You show up, you know, you show up with a baseball cap on and a cup of coffee and you go to work, you know. I mean, that's the one, the, one of the great things about doing theater and film and TV is you have your costumes, you have, and I always either try to steal a little something to take home or, you know, or oftentimes the producers will give you a little, you know, keepsake, and, which is awesome. Uh, you always get gifts, I mean, I, you know, I have gifts and things like that that we got from the show, but, you know, or signing uh, the posters, but there's no, like, tuxedo mask mask that I wore. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine? That would be hilarious. I want, I want VO to be that way, where you actually show up and they're like, uh, Vince, can you please put on the costume? <laughs> <laughs> but no one's going to see me. In front of a mic, oh yes, but we need you in full costume. Um, we're gonna dye your hair. Uh, and be like, hey, could you please throw the rose? Get into character. I don't know that anybody's gonna hear the rose being thrown. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are <laughs> Yeah. Well, now there's different ways to connect. I mean, you know, we, you can buy a, a rig and, you know, and through the internet, you can do Source Connect, ISDN. ISDN's being phased out, but, you know, there's different ways to actually be live in a room. I mean, I do it all the time. My studio in LA, I have ISDN, which is, you guys know what ISDN is? Yeah. No. Uh, it's, uh, it's old school phone cables, but it's a two-line two uh, phone line. And basically it allows you, if you use a, a, a box that, transfers the, the, the information, the digital box. Uh, I use a Telezephyr box, and then you hook up uh, with another studio, and you're actually live. So, so I could be in my house in LA and be recording with New York, or be recording somewhere else in the world, and we're live. Now they do it, now you don't even need that. Now you, you know, Source Connect, uh, there's, uh, there's um, Audio TX, there's a whole bunch of different systems, uh, voice over IP. Um, that you do it through uh, through the internet and you hook up live and so you actually do I record all the time with Source Connect now in New York because they don't you can't get ISD anymore but sorry uh, so so you don't always have to be in the cities it is better if you're in LA or New York or Chicago or one of those major cities like or, or uh, you know Dallas or where you know if you want to do uh, that the animation that's being done in Dallas or in Texas areas. Um, just because you have more access, it's more immediate, and sometimes they want you physically in the studios to do the work, but you can still do the work, you know, you can start, at least, and start to showcase your work from anywhere. But sorry, go ahead, finish your question. Um, but uh, when you do, like, move to either, whatever places, you know, you feel is good for you, mm -hmm. I know that, um, how do you, I guess, a question I had is, how is it, uh, how are you able Money to pay our bills, but we want to do what we love. That's the hardest thing, man. It's the hardest thing. Um, I was there when I was a kid and younger. You know, we all do it. But I think the best advice I can give is that, and I try to say this to every anyone that asks me. You know, when they say they want to be an actor or get into voice work, you truly, 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 you must have. It, 
for me, when I was a kid, it, it was like oxygen. It was like water. It was like sleep. If I, if somebody told me that I was never going to act again in my life, you might as well have ended my life right there. It was like I need. It was like it was like the air I needed to breathe. So when if it's that means that much to you, you find a way. And that's really, truly the only answer. I, I mean, honestly, there is no, there is no answer. You can, the same question applies to, I mean, as artists, it's a different path, the creative path of an artist. But in any line of work, an accountant, a businessman, anything you do, uh, you know, a person who, who builds houses, my father was a carpenter. In any line of work you do, there's always going to be tough choices. Sometimes a family member gets sick, and you go, I have to go to work to pay my bills, but I need to be there to take care of my family member. You know, every line of work has a tough choice to make. When you want something bad enough, you find a way. You get up earlier in the morning. You stay up later at night. You, you know, I, I tell people when they, when they ask me for advice on getting into VO, I always say, watch the work. Watch, you know, the people, the, you know, we fast forward through commercials now. We don't even care anymore. Commercial work, if anybody attended the VA panel this morning, commercial work is one of the most lucrative parts of our business. I mean, I'm the voice of Dunkin' Donuts right now. I'm the voice of Proactive. Um, you know, I've, I've been the voice of financially. Commercial work has been, you know, what, what's made me all my money in my career. You know, and then I and film and television as well and theater. But commercial work has been 99% of my income, uh, and so that's why I always laugh when I hear people, you know, you know, part of my friends but piss on commercials and say they. Commercials are what they are the they are the you know the commerce of our world. I mean they are kind of the sad corporate side of it. You know what I mean? Where we become sort of like the you know we're we're, we're pawning merchandise and stuff like that. But there's also there's an incredible creativity and fun to that too. You know if you if you can embrace that side of it. Um, so I highly recommend watch commercials. Don't fast, if this is what you want to do. Don't fast forward through them. Listen to them. And then find the things that you go, hey, that guy sounds a bit like me. And that's how I started. I, when I, especially in Las Vegas, you know, in Toronto too, but um, whenever I drove in my car, all I, I would listen mostly to commercials, music in the background, but I would like turn off the commercials and be like, oh, okay, I hear what that guy's doing, or that's a new sound, or that's a new way of reading. And, so, and when I was a little kid, without even realizing it, I would watch, you know, Scooby-Doo, and I would imitate the voices, like, you know, and then all of a sudden, that's, that's how you learn. You learn the rhythms of things. You, you learn how to create that stuff. And when it comes to work, um, yeah, sometimes you have to make those hard, those hard choices, you know. But the best advice I can give for that is try to find a job that allows you that freedom. Try to, you know, like a waiting job is always, that's why, that's why most actors, I was too, was a waiter, bartender. I mean, they're, they're the most flexible jobs, you know. They're, they're you know, uh, I used to work a job when I graduated from university that worked from, I would start at like 8, 9 o'clock at night and go until 6 in the morning. And then I'd go audition. So uh, some days I'd like, we'd be up for 24 straight hours. You know, I'd never sleep. Uh, just to pay my bills, act when I could. You know, and then I'd beg my employers to give me some time off when I booked a job. And they'd be like, okay, you know. Um, sorry, another question. I think we're, we're wrapping up pretty soon, so I want to get everybody in. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> America runs on Duncan. <laughs> you guys probably hear that all the time, man. Right? About every two seconds of every day. My wife and I watch TV at night, and honestly, it's like every every five minutes, you know, a commercial comes on. I'll look at my wife and be like, cha ching. <laughs> <laughs> And I, here's, the, here's the funniest thing, as a Canadian, uh, I love donuts. I mean, donuts, uh, we have a coffee with, yeah, I was the voice of Tim Hortons for years in Canada. And then, uh, yeah, but I'm, so I'm a huge donut fan, so it's so funny whenever I do spots for Dunkin', we'll be like releasing new, you know, like right now they have the brownie batter heart-shaped donuts for Valentine's. Those things are ridiculously delicious. They're insanely delicious, and I'll be doing sessions and I'll be like, I, honestly, as soon as we finish sessions, I'm like straight to Dunkin'. Gotta get a donut, you know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. Cha-ching! 
Um, you know what? I'm sure they would give them to me, but they, the producers, the, we, the, the, <laughs> the actual company, Duncan, is in Boston, and I record out in New York, so I actually have never met any of them. I've never met them face to face. I talk to them, we work together, we, you know, I've worked with them for, well, it's been almost three years now, and I, I feel like I know all of them, I've never seen any of their faces, <laughs> which is the weirdest thing, I keep saying I gotta go to, I gotta go to Boston and meet everybody, because it's so bizarre to have this like three year relationship with people, and then you go, I've never met you. In Proactive, I've been doing Proactive for years now, and like Rose, who's one of my main producers, we've been working together for almost five years now, and I've never met her. It's the weirdest thing, like, and yet I feel like we're friends, you know, we send each other gifts and stuff and cards, and you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, but um, I think we're, we gotta wrap up, so thank you guys for coming, man. It was really, really, really good. I've got, a, I've got an autograph signing session now, so if you guys wanna come and chat, and one-on-one, -on -one, take some photos, sign some stuff, Please come join me, and if you see me walking around all by myself, which I've been doing the last couple of days, come up, say hi, hang out, and uh, you know, it's fun. And ask any other questions you guys have. Where are you signing autographs? Um, if you want autographs, uh, by the Potomac Ballrooms in the glass hallway section, it, it might be Carlin too. So. You can make oh yeah, Mike's gonna be there. That's right. I think we're going. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys. Awesome.